And what I want to do is, for the next probably like 45 minutes, take you through um, the core of what we're teaching at Singularity University. Typically, we teach this in a one week long program, costs you $14,000. So today you get it in 45 minutes for about $0. <laughs> so it's going to be a little bit like um, uh, quick, calling this field guide to exponential thinking. So typically, the, when, we, uh, when we engage with people, like this is typically what the, the, the types of questions they have. Like, what does the future look like? What am I missing? How do I disrupt? How do I not get disrupted? Uh, my friends from Barclays, um, we run a bunch of programs for you talking about this, particularly this. Um, you haven't seen this before, right? You weren't part of the... Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> awesome. So the, um, the three factors I want to concentrate on today is what is happening in the world um, of technology? How do you make sense of that change? So I give you a bunch of frameworks around this. And why does it matter? The why does it matter? The good news is like you all have that checked. Um, so we'll spend a tiny little bit amount of time on this. Typically, I spend a lot of time on this because it's really, really uh, important. So let's start out with the, uh, uh, the brief way of, of introducing myself. So I, again, like I work at this weird place, Singularity University. We're a mission-driven organization, what is called the California B Corp, or a certified B Corp. And our mission is very simple. It's to educate, inspire, and empower leaders, people like yourself, to apply exponential technologies, which is what we're spending most of our time on today, to address humanity's grand challenges. That is a nicer and friendlier way to say BFPs. Um, because we work with corporate clients, we couldn't say BFPs. <laughs> Plus, it is copyrighted. So we don't do that. Um, uh, just a way of like, uh, saying this out loud, like you can obviously, I'm a very uh, social person. Like you find me pretty much everywhere at PFINET. Um, obviously, I have my contact details here, et cetera. So let's get into the what. Let's talk a little bit about like, what's the change we're seeing in the world. And I fundamentally believe that if you want to understand what the future will hold for you, you need to understand the past first. L.P. Hartley once said that the past is a foreign country. And it feels weird, like it feels weird when we look back. Um, but it's really, really fu fundamentally important to understand where we are coming from uh, because it will allow you to predict the future in a much easier way. And let's start with this. Um, in the late 60s, an organization out of Palo, Palo Alto, which is very close to where we are um, located with Singularity University called Xerox, um, started a research organization called Xerox Park. And what's remarkable about Xerox Park is that in a seven year time span, very short amount of time, seven years, with a team not bigger than this room, about 25 people core staff and 200 people total, they invented roughly 50% of what is the core technology which makes up the internet today. They invented the laser printer, which led to the uh, desktop publishing revolution. They invented the graphical user interface, probably most notably, because that's the thing which powers your, uh, your Macintosh or Windows computer today. And they invented Ethernet, which led to the connected computer revolution. So they basically invented pretty much everything we are using today in technology in a very short amount of time. Now the question is, how could they do this? Like short, a very short amount of time, very small team. And the way they could do this is, and this is a quote from Alan Kay, is by inventing the future. And Alan Kay once said, like, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. This has two interesting consequences. The first is, if you want to predict the future, you, it is on you to invent this future. Secondly, and this is probably more importantly, when you turn that sentence around, it means that if you are not inventing the future, if you're not working on the future, the future will happen to you. This is, by the way, what happens to 48% of Americans who don't go voting, right? The future happens to you. This is Alan Kay, 2008, um, at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California, showing a computer called the Dynabook. This is two full years before Apple introduced the iPad. So two years before Apple introduced the iPad, Alan Kay, one of the people from Xerox Park, gets up and shows a computer which looks a lot like an iPad. It's a folio computer. You see it as a little keyboard. Uh, touch screen, etc. Now that's curious, interesting, but it's not revolutionary by far. Clearly Apple was working on the iPad by that time. There's no question about it. What's really interesting is that in 1972, Alan Kay wrote a 30-page paper describing the Dynabook in great detail. The way he could do this, and this is important to understand, is like you could not build this computer in 1972, like regardless how much money you would spend on it, because a lot of the electronics didn't exist. Uh, touch screens weren't invented, batteries weren't powerful enough, uh, semiconductors were the size of a room full of electronics to make this thing work, not you know, a little folio computer. But what Alan Kay could do is, he could look at the past, the last 10-ish years of computing, and 
see that computers getting more powerful, smaller, and he could see the advancements and then project from that into the future and say, hey, this is how the future should look like. What's interesting about this paper is not only that he describes this computer in great detail, so basically a full 40 years before Steve Jobs shows you the iPad, he invented the iPad, but he also predicted very interestingly the use case for this thing. So typically when I've got a slightly older audience who've got kids, if you happen to have an iPad, I can guarantee you that you're not using it because your kids are monopolizing it, right? That's like, so it's really fascinating to, to think about this. Um, this is Alan Kay in 2012 at the demo conference, and it's a very short clip. I just want to play this as he makes a very important uh, thing. So the, on the other hand, we spent roughly two to three times a person's salary each year just on technology for that person because we were buying, as I'll show you, we bought our way into the future because Moore's Law says that if you're interested in something 15 years from now, you can have that computing power now if you're willing to pay through the nose. So this is important to understand, and I'll shift my position a little bit to where it's like the sun is like right in my eyes. Um, so if the, the point Alan is making here is that you can actually cheat. You can see the future today, you just need to pay for it. It exists. If you want to know, wanted to know how virtual reality looks like today with the Oculus Rift, the HTC Vive, and Google Cardboard, I could have shown this to you 10 years ago if you would have given me a $100,000 check. So it's important to understand that you can actually cheat your way into the future. You don't even need to invent it. You can actually buy the, computer, the future um, today. And William Gibson, the uh, futurist author, uh, science fiction author, once said, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So the future exists. It's just in the wrong pockets. Okay? So when we uh, talk about exponentials, and the future being exponential. Let's unpack this a little bit. It's kind of a weird term. So if you think back to your math class, Math 101, classic exponential trend, doubling every time period. If you map that out, always looks like this. So you go from 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and so on. Every business plan in Silicon Valley, by the way, revenue side, always like this. <laughs> now, the most important and probably most well-known uh, exponential trend in technology is Moore's Law. Gordon Moore, co-founder of Intel, 50 years ago, formulated an observation. He wrote a paper for a magazine, an op-ed, where he wrote that he saw that the last 10 years, the number of transistors per square inch has doubled every year back in the day. And he predicted this to be true for the next 10 years going forward. This was later revised to two years, so the time span got a little bit longer, and has been true for 50 years. So every 50 years, we, uh, every two years, we double the number of transistors. To make this a little bit more tangible and to give you an idea of how this looks like, uh, this is ASCII Red. ASCII Red was uh, commissioned in 1997, cost 55 million US dollars, was commissioned for Sandia National Lab. They did uh, atomics weapons testing on this thing. This was the very first, this computer was the size of a tennis court and was the very first computer which broke through 1.3 or 1 teraflop, so 1 trillion floating point operations per second. So imagine like you would do one trillion, two plus two in your head in one second, that's what this computer could do. It was one of the most powerful computers, it was a real breakthrough in the world. So this is 1997. Nine years later, you walk into Best Buy, you buy a PlayStation 3, cost you $499, 2.1 teraflops. <laughs> so within nine years, you go from something we deploy to do atomics weapons testing to something you now use to play destroy the earth on your big screen television. Goes a different way too. So you take this guy here, was released at the uh, end of 2015, called Pi Zero. This is a full-scale computer. This thing is the size of a peg of gum. You can plug in a monitor, a keyboard, put in some RAM. You can run Windows on this thing. Cost you five bucks. The compute power of this this baby here, which is literally what you would get for the price of a large venti Starbucks latte, gets you two and a half. Uh, Cray-1 supercomputers. Each of those Cray-1s, they were uh, commissioned in 1975. This was the predominant supercomputer. This was the thing which created the term supercomputer. Each of those has more compute power than NASA had to put the man on the moon. So literally, for the cup, for the price of a cup of coffee, you get two and a half times all of the compute power NASA had to put a man on the moon. And then it gets super, super small. 
This is a processor uh, from a company called Freescale. You see, this is a golf ball, dimple in a golf ball. This processor has, is about two millimeters by 1.6 millimeters, has the raw compute power of an early stage Pentium processor. It costs you 75 cents if you buy it in bulk. This processor itself, and there's many others like it, is the sole reason why everything and anything which has an electric cord will become smart. There's no question about it, because you get it for free. Like, why wouldn't you? Classic question I always get is like, why would I want to have a smart toaster? I don't know, because I don't want one. But you will get it for free. Every single light bulb in your house will be like this. Now, this thing also runs on so little battery power that you can power it with a normal battery for about two years, which makes this processor, or a similar processor, something they call smart dust. When you go up to Napa, where we had the last program, um, they have $10, $15 sensors, which you uh, deploy on the ground. They measure the water content in the soil form a mesh network, talk to each other, and then talk to a cloud-based infrastructure to tell the winter exactly when they have to uh, water the vines to get the perfect result. After two years, when the battery runs out, they just plow them into the ground. It doesn't matter. They just buy new ones. So computing goes two interesting ways. It gets incredibly powerful, and it gets incredibly smart. Now, it's important to understand these exponential trends not just happen in computing. They happen in many other industries as well. I just want to peel out one important industry which will change, fundamentally will change the way we live our lives, which is DNA sequencing. So reading and writing DNA. And the reason why this is important is when you can read and write DNA, you can, for example, attack a cancer cell um, in, a, in a microscopic way. You can literally kill that particular cell. Um, you can eradicate uh, diseases, you can create new crops, etc., etc. So here's how this plays out. The cost of DNA sequencing, this is reading DNA, for the full genome of a human being, the first time we did this, 1997, 2.7 billion US dollars, seven years of effort, this was what was called the Human Genome Project. This is a massive breakthrough for mankind, like unprecedented. So we took a whole genome and sequenced one genome. 2.7 billion US dollar. That genome you can actually download. It's in the public domain. 2007, there was a company starting to do this as a professional service, as a commercial service. Cost you $350,000, still a couple months of an effort. So you go from something which is really, you can do once, like literally once, to something, you know, it's expensive. 2014, the price dropped to $1,000. This is the steepest price drop we've ever seen in any technology, bar none. So you go from something nation states can do it and do it once to something your doctor can prescribe. Now I teach my entrepreneurs when they look at, the, at these cost curves, like these exponential cost curves, I teach them two important questions. The first is, if it's here, where will it go? Where does this price go? And you talk to experts and they will tell you that price will go down to pennies, literally pennies. So reading DNA will become close to free. And then the second question becomes, what do you do with it? What do you do with reading the genome for free? Well, I can show you two examples. The first is this. In the future, this is not hypothetical, when you flush the toilet, the toilet will run a genome uh, sequencing on your stool and give you a full health report. <laughs> so, sounds crazy. There's people literally working on this. The second one is, technology has always a really interesting dark side. So everyone, every single one of you is currently losing cells, skin cells, follicle, hair, etc. When you leave this room, Daniel and I will hoover, and we will run a full genomic fingerprint on every single person in this room. That sounds pretty wild, right? It sounds crazy. Well, let me introduce you to a friend. This is Heather dewey Harkboard, a New York-based artist, so actually we can see her work tomorrow, um, who has a really interesting art project. Let me tell, let me have her tell you. We don't know yet how our DNA might be used against us in the future. New York artist Heather Dewey Hagborg. Heather Dewey Hagborg. Heather Dewey Hagborg. One artist in New York is making 3D models of people's faces, people that she's never met. She calls the project Stranger Visions. The strangers are people whose genetic material she finds on the sidewalks and subways of New York City. How much can I actually find out about you from something that you accidentally leave behind? Crazy, right? 
So let me explain what she does, just so you're clear about this. Heather collects cigarette butts from the streets, literally stuff like we throw away. She extracts the DNA from that cigarette butt from your saliva, which is a technique the FBI is using for like 20 years. Then she runs this through a genomic sequencing machine, like the one I showed you for $1,000, which she literally has in the basement of her studio. And then, and this is the part which is really hard, then she sends this off to a very advanced DNA testing lab. And they basically look at their DNA, give her back a digital file, which she then uses to reconstruct your facial features, because again, like they're of, of course encoded in your DNA, right? They're your bone structure, your hair color, etc. And then lastly, she prints these 3D masks. That is to say, we are rapidly moving into a world which will look dramatically different than what we have seen and felt in our lifetime so far. Now here's a challenge. Albert Allen Bartlett, who taught at uh, UC uh, Boulder, uh, once said that the greatest shortcoming of the human um, race is our inability to understand the exponential function. So let me explain this. We're calling this the uh, linear exponential deception. Here is how this works. As we grow up as humans, the world around us is linear. Like the observable universe, by and at large, is, is moving on a linear path. The day has 24 hours, the uh, year has 365 days, the seasons come and go on a very predictable linear schedule. Imagine 30 linear steps. So you're really prone to think linear. You're really uh, designed to do so. 30 linear steps, one step after the other. How far do you get? 30 meters, right? 30 yards, it's super easy. And you've got also a really good sense of how far that is. So for me, it's like, I would guess it's probably kind of halfway to the room, a little, a little wider. All right, so now we're taking exponential steps, 30 of those. So every step twice as far as my last step. I go one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, and so on. How far do you get? Gut feel. Mars. To the moon, Mars, Mars is good, moon. Anyone else? So moon, Mars. Okay, so uh, how far is it to the moon in miles or kilometers? I don't have any idea. There we go. So to clean this up, it's a billion meters. It's 25 times around planet Earth. It's to the moon, back from the moon, halfway to the moon again. Mars is further, unfortunately, way further. This demonstrates two things. The first is, you're really not well equipped to understand the nature of exponential trends. Now, technology moves exponentially, but you have no idea, you can't feel it. Secondly, if you have something which moves from, an exp from a linear to an exponential trend, it moves from something which grew to 30 to something which grows to a billion. Okay, so it's really important to understand this, and we'll, we'll un uh, cover this a little bit more um, as we go. So, exponential trends, linear thinking, here's three important points in this graph. The first is this. Because exponential trends start out very slowly, they inch forward in the beginning, and your linear brain wants them to be better. You come to a world where we, which we call disappointment. Anyone played with Google Glass? You did, right? Perfect. So I was at Google when we released Google Glass. I was wearing Google Glass for three months on campus. I can tell you about disappointment. Google Glass is too expensive, battery life is terrible, functionality is pretty meh, and you look like an idiot. So you're disappointed, right? The challenge is, every time I gave someone Google Glass and they were disappointed, they're dismissing it. They look at Google Glass and they're like, oh, this is not good, it's not gonna be good. But then you come to this magic moment where Steve Jobs gets on stage and does this whole like, oh, one more thing, and he shows you the iPhone. And this is where the magic line cross. I've seen the iPhone, the keynote, as a live stream while I was in Germany. And when I, Steve Jobs did his whole like iPhone thing, a colleague of mine st stood next to me, like, nice dress, watching the show, very smart, smart and rich guy. And Steve Jobs is like, hey, here's the iPhone, and does his magic. And my friend pulls out his brand new, just bought Nokia phone, and looks at it and says shit. Because that was the moment when you know that phones aren't phones anymore, phones are mini computers, everything has changed. And then you come into chaos and amazement. Chaos and amazement is the world we're living in. Chaos and amazement is smartphone penetration today in Kenya, roughly 7%. So 98% phone penetration, 7% of those are smartphones. In three years, that number is 90%. In three years, all of Kenya is on the internet. 
That's chaos and amazement. That is what unseats existing companies. Now here's the challenge. If you stay on this line, this is your path to doom. This is your path to doom in your thinking. This is where Nokia stayed, which last quarter's revenue was $714 million in losses. Nokia hasn't made a single phone for years. And Nokia was by far the largest phone manufacturer in the world and was by far the most profitable phone manufacturer in the world. But they didn't see that happen. And they stayed there, and that's where they went. Ray Kurzweil, one of our founders, um, formulated something called the law of accelerating returns. This has two components. The first one is easy to understand when I tell you, but it's hard to really internalize. So the challenge is technology moves on an exponential curve, which means that the actual rate of change is also accelerating. Like there's more stuff happening quicker every single time because we're moving on an exponential curve. The second interesting insight is this. Ray was interested in this idea of how stable are these trends over longer periods of time. And he looked at um, actual data in the computing space. So instead of using number of transistors per square inch on an integrated circuit, which you can only do when you have actually transistors, he looked at calculations per second per $1,000, which is the economic underpinning of Moore's law. And then he looked at actual data, so that black dots are actual data points. This is a logarithmic scale over 110 years. And what he found is that Moore's law in its, in its uh, existence, this exponential trend is true for more than 110 years, not just 50 years, which we knew from Moore's law. So it's an absolute stable trend. And as you go through the years, you see wars, recessions, famines, didn't matter. It stayed perfectly fine on this trend. Now here's the challenge with that. These exponential trends in isolation are actually not exponential. They're what is called sigmoids. They're S-curves. They're flattened out. Moore's law. Number of transistors per square inch per integrated circuit. If you take that to its logical extreme, you come into subatomic transistors which don't exist. So what happens is they flatten out. And what Ray found is that once a technology becomes matured, it gets displaced by another technology. And in conjunction, they form a perfect, perfect exponential again which then leads to 110 years of Moore's law. If you're familiar with the innovator's dilemma, Clayton Christensen, he talks about the same thing, different perspective. <coughs> Clayton's insight was to say, a company which dominates one era, one technology era, is never, typically, the company which dominates the next. Mainframe computers, GE, Honeywell, IBM. Mini computers, DEC and uh, digital uh, equipment and a few others. PCs, Microsoft and the OEM manufacturers, handheld devices, phones, tablets, Google and Apple, Internet of Things, I can guarantee you it's not going to be Apple. Google probably, also quite like, questionable. So really interesting. So every time you have a, a break, a shift in a technology, is the moment when you want to be an entrepreneur, because this is when you unseat the giants. So the second thing you can do with this graph is, you can extrapolate it out. So we believe this graph to be true. We know it's true for 110 years. We believe it to be true in the future. Then you can determine the moment when you have a computer which has the raw compute power of a human brain, which happens in less than 15 years. In 15 years, someone will build a computer which has the raw compute power of a brain. And now, as we are doubling, right, it's an exponential trend. Two years later, we have two human brains. Four years later, we've got four, right? So you can actually determine the moment when you have all human brains, 7.2 billion brains in one single compute unit, which happens in the year 2050 to 2060. That is to say that very, very quickly, in the very, very near-term future, the phone in your pocket will be, in raw compute terms, be smarter than you are. So again, we're moving rapidly into a very, very different world. But one thing you should not forget is how weird that world feels to us. This is Siri. What time is my appointment on Sunday evening? You have four appointments last Tuesday at 12 a.m. I said, what time is my appointment on Sunday evening? You have four appointments last Tuesday at 12 a.m. I'm not asking about Tuesday. I don't know what you mean by, I'm not asking about Tuesday. How about a web search for it? So here's the challenge, right? <laughs> so again, do you remember like the point I made about disappointment? Siri is disappointing. It doesn't understand us. 
But Siri, which is an artificial intelligence, currently moves on an absolutely perfect exponential. It literally doubles in capacity every year. So how good will Siri be in only seven years? Not just really good, 128 times better than it is today. Now, Siri, 128 times better than it is today, is probably better than any human in understanding you, other than your spouse. So here's your first insight. As trivial as this sounds, it's actually really important and really fundamental. Once the technology becomes digitized, it moves on an exponential curve. The biggest business opportunities is when you find something which is analog and you turn it into a digital good. Because then everything changes. It moves from a linear curve to an exponential. Complete sea change in every underlying factor. So how do you make sense of this change? Let me give you a couple of models to, uh, to help you with that. The first one is something called the 60s of disruption. This is Peter Diamandis, our other co-founder. And let me explain this to you by talking about the digital camera. This is the first digital camera. This is a, a gentleman called Stephen Sasson who invented this digital camera. And you can see it's a little clunky. It's also 0.01 megapixels. It had 100 by 100 pixel resolution. It's horrible. It's terrible. Classic case for disappointment, right? So here's how this works. You turn something from analog to digital. You take analog film, which is a chemical process, and you turn it into a digital good. In the beginning, it's deceptive. The first digital camera, 0.01 megapixels. It's on a perfect exponential. It's doubling. So what is the next? The next iteration had 0.02. The next iteration, 0.04, 0.08, 0.16. By which time, the company which was behind this, a company called Kodak, decided to kind of halt the development because they could only see the zero in the beginning. Right? It goes from zero to zero. It's just like, it doesn't move. Then it becomes disruptive. Digital camera disruptive, two megapixels. This is the moment when you don't buy a, f a film camera anymore. You dematerialize it. Today, a camera is not a camera anymore. Today, a camera is a $1 piece of hardware attached to your phone, which is software. You demonetize it. Now I'm not buying film or a camera. Or if, I'm, if I'm really feeling splurgy, I'm buying a 99 cent, cent uh, photo filter. And then you democratize it. Now everybody has a camera. There's 3 billion photos uploaded to the internet every single day. There's 3 billion people on the internet. So literally every person on the internet is taking a picture and uploading the picture to the web every single day. You can play this with other technologies. Take Uber. Digitize the rider information. Where's the car and where's the driver? Put it on a digital map. It was deceptive because their first product was black cars, which is a town cars, which is a luxury product. It became disruptive when they copied Lyft's model and made UberX. Everybody becomes a driver. They dematerialized car ownership. If you live in San Francisco, you don't buy a car anymore. If you are a driver, you can use the car you already have. You don't need to buy a cab uh, or a black car. You demonetize it. Uber is significantly cheaper than a cab. And ultimately, and this is their last step, which they haven't fulfilled yet, they want to totally democratize access to transportation. This is a really nice model as a descriptive model to think about where is your industry. No. Here's how you make sense of this world. This comes out of the, the, uh, the world of physics. It's called first principle. And I let uh, a different gentleman explain this to you. And then uh, I think it's also important to reason from first principles rather than by analogy. So the normal way that we conduct our lives is we, 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 we reason by analogy. Um, it's, we're doing this because it's like something else that was done, mm -hmm. or it's like what um, other people are doing. Me too but, type ideas. Yeah, it's slight, well, it's, it's, yeah, it's slight iterations take, yeah. on, on, on a theme, mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and, and it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of mentally easier to reason by analogy rather than from first principles. But by first principles is kind of a physics way of looking at the world. And what that really means is you kind of boil things down to the most fundamental truths and, and say, OK, what are we sure is true or, or as sure as possible is true? And then reason up from there. Mm -hmm. uh, that takes a lot more mental energy. So you get it? First principles? Here's how this works. These guys, when they built the first self-driving car, which this one is one of the, the earlier prototypes, 
That car has a unit on top of it which is called LiDAR. That's the uh, spinning radar. That's the way the car sees what's in front and behind it. They brought this car to uh, Detroit and uh, to all the big car manufacturers. And guess what the big car manufacturers said? I don't want, I would, we, we're not buying this. Like this doesn't work because this unit here is $50,000. We are optimizing for a cent on a, screw, a screw, uh, on a screw we put into the car. Secondly, because they reason by analogy, oh yeah, you know, like even in 10 years, this will be a little bit smaller and still be this big hump, because that's all they can see. That's all the way they can think. Now, the Google guys are a little bit smarter. The Google guys are, are reasoning from first principle. They're saying, okay, what do we know to be true about the self-driving car? What well, we know to be true, we need to have this unit. We know to be true, it needs to have this massive amount of compute power. We also happen to know from first principle that we know that this stuff gets cheaper, significantly cheaper. So what was this big LiDAR unit for $50,000 became today a unit which is about this size and costs about $5,000. By the end of this year, uh, literally, like, we're waiting for the day it's going to be released. The LiDAR unit's going to be the size of a tennis ball and costs you about $500. And MIT just introduced a LiDAR unit which is this size and costs about a dollar. <laughs> now, here's the challenge. Google has a 10-year head start on building the self-driving car because they reasoned from first principle and said, like, it will take us 10 years to build the car anyway. We might as well start now and just bank on these exponential trends giving us better price-performance ratio down the road. So think about when you're thinking about like problems you want to solve, I encourage all the people I work with, like think about how do you reason from first principle. Geoffrey Moore wrote a book 25 years ago, which is literally seminal. It's called Crossing the Chasm. I think this is super, super important today. Here's the insight. As a product matures, so this is time, you go through different um, consumers, people who use and buy the product. And this is the amount of product you're selling or service you're selling. So in the beginning, you sell to innovators. That's you sell effectively to yourself. Then you've got the early adopters. Early adopters are people like myself who go on Kickstarter and buy the first Pebble watch. And for early adopters, what counts is, I want to have the product. I want to be cool. Like, I'm fine if the product really doesn't work and if I need to flash the firmware and if it's buggy. That's OK. Then you get to early majority. Early majority are the people who buy a Pebble watch but in Best Buy. They want it to be working. But it needs to be cool and like on the edge. Arguably, everyone who buys an iWatch uh, watch today is an early adopter, uh, early majority. Then you come late majority. This is my mom. My mom sees the watch and she's like, "This is cool. It like it bleaks and blims and like gives you notifications." Okay, I'm buying this. And then you get to the laggards, which is my grandma. She buys a smartwatch because there's no other watch she can buy anymore. Okay. <laughs> now, every one of these groups has slightly different needs. The big insight is there's a massive chasm between the early adopters and the early majority. There's a huge gap between these two. And as you're developing technology, particularly technology which is on the edge, you need to be super aware of this. Let me show you an example. This is a video sitting in Tesla's um, Model S with autopilot activated, so the self-driving capacity. It's scary. Oh, there's cars coming. Oh. Oh, there's cars! Ah! Bill, just put me back for me controlling. Oh dear Jesus! I could never. Ah! Ah! Oh, where's it going? God damn, Bill! Oh my God! Oh, this is so scary. My... Oh Jesus! This is my first day out, and I'm about to die. Oh come on, relax. <laughs> so, a couple of comments. First of all. Bill is her son. Putting your mom into a situation where she says, I'm about to die is not nice. <laughs> Secondly, filming it, putting it on the internet for everyone to see is really not nice. <laughs> but here's the more important thing. And I keep telling these people, this is the sole reason why the current generations of self-driving cars are massively flawed. Why nobody will drive them other than early adopters. Do you see the gap? Do you see the chasm here? It's staring you into the eye. It's the steering wheel. Because the steering wheel moves and it freaks you out. I was at Google when we did Chauffeur, which is the self-driving car project. And I sat in Chauffeur and I'm like early adopter, easy, easy. And it freaked me out that the freaking steering wheel moves. You want to touch it, right? So how do you solve it? You build this thing. 
Google removed in the little bubble car, removed the steering wheel. There is no steering wheel in the car anymore. You just punch in the address and it drives. You put people in it, this is how it looks like. We're like You said, relax. You do not do nothing. It knows when it needs to stop. It knows when it needs to go. <laughs> it actually rides better than my own car. Yes, sure. <laughs> What she really liked was that it slowed down before it went around a curve and then accelerated in the, in curve. the curve. She's always trying to get me to do, do it that way. That's the way I learned in <laughs> high school driver's ed. So this is what happens, right? So as you're thinking about your product, think about the chasm. Like, what is the chasm and how do you get over it? Let me show you one more example. This is um, one of our professors, a guy called Mark Post from the Netherlands. He's the first guy who uh, created cultured meat. This is meat which is grown in a, um, in a petri dish. So no cow is being harmed. They take a little tiny amount of um, cow cells um, from a living cow, and then they coax those cells into replicating. And this is a hamburger patty. They did this four years ago. That hamburger patty, one single hamburger patty, $350,000. So not quite your hamburger like super meal special from McDonald's. Half a year ago, they repeated this. That same hamburger patty, $11. We are inches away from creating lab-grown meat. And if you know anything about meat production, it's a freaking problem on this planet. It like, takes a lot of water, creates methane, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to do this. But here's the problem. Every time I show this someone, every time I show this a group like yours, typically I get literally a bifurcation of the group. There's one side of the group, which is like me. I'm like, wow, this is cool. Like, I'm even vegetarian. I would eat this, right? It's like lab-grown. It's like no animal being harmed. This is great. And also, it's probably better, right? It doesn't have hormones and all this kind of crap in it. And then they've got the other side. They're like, I would eat only meat which comes from an animal, and that animal needs to have a face. Fair point. So how do you overcome this? One of my companies, one of the companies in our portfolio, is doing uh, also lab-grown meat and leather products. Their meat product, their initial meat product, is something they call a steak chip. It's literally like a potato chip, but out of, made out of a steak-ish material, lab-grown. We tested this. Everybody eats it. You know why? Because there is no such thing as a steak chip. There is no mental reference you have. You're not like, ugh, this is not a real steak chip. Of course it's a real steak chip, because there is no such thing, right? Whereas with a burger, you have a, you have a reference point. So as you're going through this world, think about how do you overcome these problems. As you're developing your solutions, this is where I see a lot of startups basically die. Because they think they have a market, because they get the early adopters, and then they try to push, and then they never get to the actual market. Digitization creates something interesting which is called abundance. So we're living in a world which we perceive as scarce, and for good reason. Like I recently published a book. Book publishing is an interesting process because you need to grow a bunch of trees. You take those trees, you turn them into pulp, you print, turn that pulp into paper, you print on the paper, you bind it, you put it in a truck, you go to borders and you sell the book. That's a very scarce resource because there's only so many trees we can like, turn into paper. Once you turn that into a digital good, everything changes. Because once I turn that book into a digital good, the cost of duplication, the cost of replication, and the cost of distribution go down to zero. And everything changes. Mark Andreessen once said, software is eating the world. This is what happens. Music. Once we had Napster, a product which was made out of oil, namely CDs and uh, records, turned into a digital good. Now abundantly available to us. Uh, Spotify, 9.99, 140 million songs in my pocket. Knowledge. I grew up in Encyclopedia Britannica. Once Jimmy Wales created Wikipedia, knowledge becomes a, um, an abundantly available product. It's really important to understand this. So once a good becomes digital, the cost of duplication and the cost of distribution go down to zero. The thing which a lot of people misunderstand, they think it becomes free. That is not the case. What happens is the business models change and the biggest disruptions in any industry happens. You saw this with the music industry, you saw it with film, you saw it with books. Here's an interesting one to, think, to ponder about. I'm literally talking about this with uh, Bayer, the uh, pharmaceutical company. If you think about prescription drugs, what are prescription drugs? They're technically just a molecule, right? And they're like made into like a pill or anything else. Now, we are at the brink of creating 3D printers which can print on a molecule basis. We can already do this, it's just way too expensive. 
but we are at the brink of getting there. So in the future, I could download the digital representation of the molecule, send it to CVS, or even do it at home and print that molecule. The whole distribution and replication thing goes away, right? Like nobody actually needs to make pills anymore and put them into blister packs and send them out to a pharmacy. So the Bayer guy is thinking about, okay, so how would this world look like? Well, you probably have a 999, all you can eat, all your prescription drugs for free, digital subscription. It's a really interesting world if you're thinking about drug dealing, right? <laughs> Just saying. Also really interesting world if you think about, um, if you're familiar with uh, piracy, if, you, if you're familiar with the term torrenting, like interesting world where like, I can torrent my prescription drugs. So let me give you one last um, model. This is a really important model, particularly for, for this crowd. Um, this is Stuart Brand, who's uh, the guy who invented the whole Earth catalog, which is the spiritual um, predecessor to the World Wide Web. And he created a model called the Pace Layer Model. And this is all about change and how change manifests itself in the world. The idea is the following. Change happens at different paces. paces. It starts out with nature. Nature is incredibly slow to change. Like unless, you know, man-made man -made interventions, nature changes basically never. Then culture, governance, infrastructure, commerce, and fashion. Fashion moves on a daily basis, right? Like what I'm wearing today might not be like hip tomorrow. So here's the challenge. All our attention is up here because it's the fast moving layer. It's the way like the action happens. All the real change happens on the layers below. So if you're thinking about pushing change into the world, you really need to think about how, do you, how does it affect the different layers. Take Uber. Uber plays mostly in the commerce layer, which is a very fast moving layer. Uber tries to move the same speed down into the other layers. And they hit the governance layer, which moves significantly slower. So the governance layer says like, whoa, hold on. Which is the reason why there is no Uber in Germany, there's no Uber in France, where they actually burn the caps down. There's no Uber in Austin, Texas. Because the governance, right? There's a local competitor, I know. Because the governance layer says like, no, you can't. Now Uber now, I mean, they see this now, so they start investing into lobbying and like pushing on the governance layer because they now understand that if they move the governance layer, all their work up here becomes incredibly easy. So as you are instigating change in the world, think about which of those layers are you touching, like which of those layers are the layers which are relevant to you, and figure out how do you make them move. It's really important to understand. So here's your second one. Figure out like what does 10x look like? This is Google's moonshot thinking. The e easiest way to think about this, this is this like thinking 10 times as big. The easiest way I can explain this to you is Nacho. So Nacho is currently raising money and Nacho comes to me and says like, I'm raising 6 million US dollars. I'm like, that's great. What do you use the money for? And if he has half a brain, he obviously knows how he wants to spend that money, of course. Otherwise, he wouldn't be a good entrepreneur. This is something I did when I was a venture capitalist. When we liked Nacho, we said, that's amazing. We give you $60 million. What do you do? We literally give you 10 times as much. I can guarantee you 99% of entrepreneurs have no clue what, they say, what to say. They all tell you like, oh, we go into more countries. We are hiring a few more people. That's never the answer. The best entrepreneurs say, you know what? That's a great question. Let me come back to you. And then they rework their whole thinking. They force themselves to think about what can I actually do if I th think 10 times as big? And then they come back to us, and then obviously we don't want to give Nacho $60 million, but then we take his plan, <laughs> we take his plan and say, okay, now you have a plan to actually get to that num number, let us help you get there. So a really powerful question to ask yourself. So let's talk a tiny little bit about the why. And again, like I cut out most of the slides because like for you guys this is really like, you get this. It's because the big picture, obviously. Technology for the sake of technology is boring, meaningless. It doesn't matter. It's an intellectual exercise. About 20-ish years ago, I read this quote, Albert Einstein, we shall require a substantially new manner of thinking if mankind is to survive. And that made me not sleep for a while because of the word of survival. And I fundamentally believe that's to be true. By the way, just to say this out loud, Every single indicator on this planet moves in the right direction, right? We live longer, there's less people dying, there's more people having access to um, education, etc. But we need to move faster. 
And I believe, fundamentally believe, that thinking in a different manner, we need to change the way we think, not just act. We need to way, change the way we think. And Daniel and I, we love this quote. It's like, I, I challenge my entrepreneurs to really think about like, what does it take to make a problem go away? There's this notion of like, you know, Steve Jobs ran around and said like, we need to make a dent in the universe. And it sounds really cool and cute until you start thinking about it. And you're like, really? Like, we're making a dent? I don't think we have the time on this planet anymore that we can make dents. I think we really need to think about how do we tackle the problems we want to tackle and make them go away. One of the entrepreneurs I've got the great privilege working with, Nithya Ramamata, works on a company called Nextleaf. They're doing um, temperature monitoring for um, vaccine fridges. So 20 to 30% of vaccines spoil in the third world because of a break in the cold chain. She solved this. I started working with her when I was at Google and then I took her with me to um, Singularity. She is now, this is three years later. So I asked her the question. When I was at Google, she came with a prototype of the product and she had some field tests. And I looked at her and was like, that's great. Like you have everything in your hand to make the problem go away. What do you do with it? And she, to her great credit, is incredibly, incredibly coachable. So she went and said like, okay, let me think about this. She's now in six African countries and all of India. She literally just completed her rollout into every single fridge in India. And every single one of the countries she's in, problem is gone. It doesn't exist anymore. That's the kind of thinking we need. How do you eat an elephant? What's the easiest, best, and only way to eat an elephant? This is important to understand. One bite at a time, right? Anyone into rowing here? Yay. There's always one person who likes rowing. That's amazing. OK. Let me tell you a story. The man's eight is the golden crown of rowing. If you know anything about rowing, rowing is a big deal in the United Kingdom. There's this whole like Oxford versus Cambridge thing. The UK hasn't won a medal in the Olympic Games until the Sydney Games for like something like 40 years in the men's eight. It's a, top, it's a complete disgrace, utter disgrace. So what they did is they fired the coach and they got a new coach. And that new coach deployed a very different tactic. Instead of going to his team and saying, we need to win the Olympics, Right? This is your moonshot, your big thinking. He said, no, what we want to do is we want to focus on one single question. Whatever we do, we ask ourselves, will it make the boat go faster? When we designed the hull of the boat, will it make the boat go faster? When we change the routine of us um, rowing, will it make the boat go faster? When we designed the diet we are taking, will it make the boat go faster? When we choose the team, will it make the boat go faster? When we go out for drinks, Will it make the boat go faster? And lo and behold, this team won the Sydney Olympics and has been undefeated since then. Because here's the logic behind it. If you improve by just 1%, 1% over 365 days, one year, 1%, your total improvement is nearly 38 times. This is how you solve the world's biggest problems. Not by saying, I'm going to solve this world's biggest problems and then doing it. If you can, good on you. But typically, by chipping away at the problem consistently and persistently every single day, a tiny little bit. By the way, if you turn this around, sorry, my Barclay friends, um, this is true for large corporations. I'm sure not for Barclay. If you turn this around and you lose 1% every single day, which is kind of like, you know, it's inching away and you don't actually feel it, after a year, you're at 0.03. You're basically gone. I have the great privilege to work with the um, uh, US Navy SEALs, which is really funny because I'm a pacifist. And uh, they have a, a, a manual, a guidebook, a handbook. And in this handbook, you'll find a formula on, literally on the first page. And it says your rate of growth, meaning your personal growth, you as a person, how do you grow, equals the magnitude of the challenge multiplied by the intensity of the attack. Your rate of growth, and again, what do you care more about in life than growing equals the magnitude of the challenge multiplied by the intensity of the attack. If that's true, and I fundamentally believe that to be true, why wouldn't you take the hardest problem you can find and tackle it as hard as you can? Because that's the way you grow. So don't forget, in a lot of cases, in a lot of industries, in a lot of technologies, we are at this really interesting infliction point. Like the life, life is changing really, really dra dramatically. Um, and you can have my slides. Like all my slides and everything is there.
finet.com forward slash hello. Download them. Have fun. Thank you. <laughs>